to edit Media Magazine because we're just journalists, we're not practitioners, and we thought it'd be fun to bring, tap some of the intellect and mindsets in the industry to tell us where the future was going. And it, it started with uh, Bob Guccione Jr., who was a professional um, editor at the time, who kind of gave us, gave us a vision. And every year since, we brought in a new um, guest editor. We had Alex Boguski last year. This year, we have David Skothner from HUGE. If you don't know about them, you should read this issue. Uh, and the important thing is that they all bring a vision for where the industry is going. And when we put this particular forum together, we tried to bring an eclectic mix of personalities from digital media, traditional media, but also really importantly from Madison Avenue, because the one thing that the marketing industry and agencies bring is a real perspective on the consumers. Remember, there are really only three ways that media content gets funded. Um, I pay, you pay, or someone else pays. So either the consumer's paying directly with premium subscriptions, or some kind of commerce is taking place. And in the old model, it was advertising. And the new model is still trying to work through it. So we're going to have some um, very influential folks here explaining how they see those models progressing. One thing I do want to say is we do cover the future of media every day, almost every second at Media Post. But we're looking very near term. You know, we're looking at the trees. So it's really fun to step back, look at the broad perspective of where we're going. Not the long, long distant future, but you know things that are going to change in the next 18 months that are going to transform our media economy. So the uh, group we brought together is very eclectic. I'll go through them really quickly. Um, really importantly, we have people from Madison Avenue who understand where the consumer purchasing um, perspective is going, because that's still an important part of the equation. So we have Trevor Kaufman, who's CEO of Schematic leading design agency, an interactive agency owned by WPP Group, doing very futuristic things with how people engage with media. Laura Lang, who's CEO of Digitas, the flagship digital enterprise within Publicis Group, really far, far future thinkers in terms of how consumers are engaging with digital media and traditional media. John Ross, who's president of the Interpublic Emerging Media Lab, actually he's now president of Shopper Science, which is a new division of Interpublic that's really focused on understanding you know, when the consumer gets into the store and starts grabbing those things off the shelf, you know, what led to that decision and what influences happened that kind of made them want to grab that product versus another? Something important to consider. We have Paul Rossi, who's Managing Director and Executive Vice President of The Economist Group, a leading content publisher. Hilary Schneider, who is Executive Vice President of America's region for Yahoo, a leading digital publisher and portal. Evan Williams, co-founder, CEO of Twitter. I don't think I need to explain that, but I don't have 140 characters worth saying. Um, Fred Wilson, co-founder of Union Square Ventures, one of the leading VCs in Silicon Valley. And you see all the activity going on this week. I hope he talks a little bit about that. I'm kind of curious. We have Michael Wolf, uh, founder of Newser, columnist for Vanity Fair, one of the great antagonists in our industry who really kind of kind of pushes the discussion. I'm glad he's on the panel today. And uh, Lauren Zelzaznik, who's the president of NBC Universal's Women and Lifestyle Entertainment Group. So with that context and background, I'd like to introduce Andrew Hayward, who is you know, one of the preeminent advisors of media companies, big and small, right now, helping them steer their way through this. Of course, he's the former president of CBS News and a great moderator. So I'd really like to introduce uh, Andrew. And they're all going to come out now. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Will everybody get set? You hear me okay? Yeah. It's everybody sit down. Um, welcome. Joe made it easy by introducing everybody. So uh, if, for those of you keeping score at home, uh, we're in alphabetical order here. So we have Trevor, Trevor, Laura, John, Paul, Hillary, Evan, Fred, Michael, and Lauren. Um, and uh, it's a large panel for a large topic, the future of media. So what we thought we would do is have a very simple format. Everybody will do... 10 minutes of opening remarks. I'll do closing remarks, and then we'll stop for your coffee break. No, it's not really what we're going to do. Uh, I asked everybody uh, to just think about opening remarks somewhere between 140 characters and two minutes. Um, and I gave them a choice of uh, six things. They can take any combination of them to talk about. Uh, one would be uh, a trend uh, that presents a great opportunity to their current business model, uh, or the reverse, uh, a trend that represents a great threat. Um, Another would be a company that is very hot now, that's going to be yesterday's news, 
in two years, um, or the reverse, a company that uh, we haven't even heard about now that's going to be, let's say, the Twitter of tomorrow. Then my favorite is a, a cliche or piece of conventional wisdom, something like content is king that a lot of people subscribe to now that's going to no longer be applicable in a couple of years, or the reverse of that, uh, something that will be conventional wisdom in a couple of years that we're not even thinking about now. So with that in mind, what we're going to do is go uh, right down the row. We're going to hear from our panelists, and after that, uh, we hope to have a, a lively, interactive, uh, fast-paced discussion. And with about 20 to 30 minutes to go, we're going to bring you into it. So please think about uh, your questions uh, as we go along. We want to include the group um, uh, in our discussion of the future of media. So Trevor, let's start with you. Okay, does, it, does this work? How do I do yeah, this? Yeah, pull, pull yeah. a little bit towards I've you. I've never, um, this threats to my business model. I've never had my last name be the first in the alphabet, <laughs> starting with K. This is a, this is a twist for By me. the way, the only reason I'm the moderator is I'm the first in the <laughs> alphabet here. Um, um, so Paul Allen couldn't do it. I, I, I don't know really what category, the, what, what I think about a lot falls in. In, I think 1994, uh, Nicholas Negroponte said, everything that can be digital will be. And that seems so obvious to us now, but what's never obvious is when that's really going to happen. And there's a, you know, as we've seen one medium after another become more digital, you know, book retailing becomes digital and then the books themselves become digital. TV really strikes me as the medium that has not yet really gotten there in terms of digital distribution, even though it, it is there in terms of digital production. And when I think about conventional wisdom, I think about everybody sort of poo-pooing interactive television and, and on-demand television. Right now, the TV market and the cable companies are actually doing very well, but when I see Comcast now, to me, the, and you know, a lot of cable companies are, are clients at Schematic, I, I see a business model so much like the way AOL was, where you're paying one company who manages the content, the advertising, the access, et cetera, and I think that at, at some point when we least expect it, that's gonna become disaggregated, whether it's through an Apple TV or a Google TV or some kind of in-device chip. So I don't know exactly what question that's answering, but that, that's the thing I think is sort of most ripe to occur at the moment. Well, in the spirit of what, um, what I think about a lot, the answer is consumer behavior. Because I believe consumer behavior is way out ahead of the way uh, the media and marketers are acting and where they're spending their money today. I think it's a dislocation that is going to have to be changed. And I believe that we as a marketing and media community are completely underestimating the role that mobile and social are going to play. The one thing that never changes, no matter what happens, is the way people feel about the need to be social. It's like the air we breathe. It's a connection that has to happen. What changes is the technology underneath it. And the technology that is coming in terms of our mobile devices, everything from those things we hold in our hands that today we call phones, um, all the way to the next generation of iPad and tablet devices, are going to change the way that we engage and interact with entertainment, news, content. So what will be profoundly different for all of us, sooner than I think we even understand, is that we will no longer talk about social as a channel. We will no longer talk about mobile as this thing we should think about later. Mobile and social are inextricably intertwined, and it's going to be the way that we engage, that we communicate, and it will redefine the nature of engagement with consumers. So um, I run something called uh, Shopper Sciences for Interpublic. And the Emerging Media Lab, which is a think tank, a research center, it's actually a physically working lab. And it's about the size of a regular suburban home filled with the latest kinds of technologies you can imagine. Everything from 3D to, uh, to mobile to advanced technology we can't show you because it's hidden in a secret room and, and everything in between. So of course, uh, representing that, the topic I want to uh, address today is coupons. <laughs> um, 
the world's largest marketers come to the lab. <coughs> and, and, and they come and stand in the midst of all this technology and they want to have access to the data that we have. We're doing thousands and thousands of shopper interviews every week. And we say, what, what keeps you up at night? What are you worried about? What are you trying to do? And the number one answer is, can't I just disintermediate that mean retailer and get straight down to the consumer? And how do I do a digital coupon? How can I get a coupon on a phone? And we say, wow, really? <laughs> is that it? I mean, we're talking about one of the world's most sophisticated devices. This incredibly powerful technology that literally is on my body literally physically can go inside my body in a way that other technologies can't. And all you want to do is do 30 cents off. And then the retailers come to us and, uh, and, and or, the, or the auto dealer associations or the pharmacies or whatever. And they, and they come and they do the same tour and they, have, they go through the same kind of data. And you say, what are you trying to do? And, and we get a list of what they're trying to do. And often marketers, you know, what's written at the top of the creative brief is what I'm trying to accomplish, what I want to do. I want to manipulate this consumer to behave the way I want. If there's one, Laura asked me before we walked up, what's one of the things that surprised me in my, in my, my full 14 months with, with the lab? And I tell you, one of the, the biggest ahas has been how humble I feel in the face of the shopper themselves. This incredibly powerful consumer who knows more about the products and services than the associate in the store or the gentleman at the auto dealership, or in some cases, the pharmacist. That, this, that, that, that their need to understand and, and, and feel empowered, and whether they did, did that research before they showed up in the midst of the transaction, or whether they bring a device along that allows them to do it in the moment, this voracious demand for information, and in, 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 in absence of the brands and the retailers delivering that information to them, they're seeking out each other increasingly do a lot of conversation about the growth of technology. And technologies, in fact, on, on say, social media, for example. And I think while the technology's been the facilitator, the real issue there is, is it, it, in the absence of serving those shoppers' needs, they're going to each other. The number one topic for moms, talking to each other, isn't how to get your kid to go to bed at night or um, how to deal with a uh, smart mouth teenager or any of the kinds of things you would think parents would want to talk about. 70% of the conversations about products and acquisition and how to spend your money efficiently. And being humble in the face of this changing technology, we could so easily go out and embrace it in terms of what we're trying to accomplish and yet we live in this incredible world. The trend I see is a flip around for marketing, for push marketing to this kind of listening marketing, letting the shoppers educate us and and flipping around and in a world where it may be incredibly easy, in fact, to be successful, harnessing that in order to, to help us make those shoppers feel smarter. Paul? Um, so I come at this as a, um, a media owner in terms of having a magazine and a website. And the two things that I look at, which are both, I think, long-term and short-term, the uh, whether you think of mobile as devices, but but principally mobile and devices bundled up together. And um, if I look at the data, what you're seeing at the moment for the first time is a substitution of people giving up one form of reading The Economist as an example, or magazines in general, and reading it on another product, i.e. digital. So there was a piece of research done recently amongst business travelers uh, by Business Traveler magazine. And they asked them simply, do you have an iPad? And this is in the UK where you know it's a little bit um, later uh, adoption. Do you have an iPad? Are you thinking of buying one? So 16% said I have one and 13% said I'm thinking of buying one. So that's 30% are already owning these devices. You see it with Kindle. Uh, I think the Kindle pricing will come down again before the holidays potentially and that will suddenly become the gift that every dad gets on Father's Day because you don't know what to buy him or every Uncle George gets on his birthday because you don't know what to buy him. So I think we have to accept that these devices are taking off. So the change in behaviour of consumers in terms of reading um, magazines is a definite uh, issue for us. And the other thing I think is you look at mobile and we sit in the US but I'll just give you a couple of uh, interesting numbers. If you look at BRIC, Brazil, India, uh, China, Russia, if you add Indonesia on there, which becomes bricky, which isn't very exciting, but just imagine that <laughs> gets added on the end there. Um, there are over 3 billion people there in those communities, of which today only 400, 450 million are online with a PC, but there's 1.2 million cell phones. And India takes off 3G, takes off in India this year. 
So I think you're going to see this incredible explosion of online media consumption in various forms, and I think it is text, not just not just web. Um, but I think it, as a certainly for us as a global media company, the world, the geography of the world is very much changing, and you're seeing mobile devices as being a leapfrog for people to consume media in a different way. So those are the two things. Well, in, uh, in thinking about it uh, in honor of Ad Week, I think the adage that I would go to is the, the traditional adage of marketers, which is, uh, I know that only 50% of my marketing works, but I don't know which 50%. And I think that was kind of a funny thing people said 20 years ago. I think today marketers don't find that amusing. And I think that um, a year or two from now, it will absolutely not be true. I think you're already starting to see that today. And I think as you think about that ability for marketers to really understand how they can reach their target audience, it will have huge impacts in terms of how media and media consumption happens and gets funded. Yep. So, in terms of trends, I would pile on to what, what Laura said about mobile specifically. It's, it's an easy one. Everyone knows that mobile is the future of everything, but um, I think the implications aren't fully appreciated, and we don't know what all those implications are, but a couple of that come to mind for, for us, and mobile is, is, to answer the question, what's exciting for our business, Twitter is started on mobile, it's all about conciseness and immediacy, so that's one of the reasons we're excited about it, but um, I also think it's going to lead to a lot more media consumption, even more than we're seeing now. Um, the, the iPad and other devices are interesting, but I think they'll be dwarfed by smartphones, uh, which are still growing like crazy. And it's not the iPhone that's going to take over the world, but Android phones are going to be selling for 50 bucks, and everybody's going to have those, which is going to drive tons and tons of, of web, online web usage. But the web is not really prepared for mobile. It's, it's, it's either from a, a user experience standpoint or a monetization standpoint. But I think, so there's going to be lots of changes in what people consume over mobile will not be the same as they consume on the web. A, and B, the advertising models on mobile, I think there's actually an opportunity to do a lot better um, be, for, for a bunch of reasons. One is we, we, people will be more likely to be logged in on a mobile device and um, you'll know more about them, such as location. And, but I think is what it's going to force is advertising models that are actually helpful and respectful to users. And so advertising is designed um, with the same consciousness of product and content design. And that's what will make it work, because people don't have the patience for anything else. Fred. Well, I'm thinking about all the same things that everybody else is thinking about up here, but... Well, that's the problem with having W, you know, it's hard for you and Michael, let alone Lauren with a Z. Oh, exactly. <laughs> Lauren, Lauren's not going to be happy. Um, so, uh, what, one thing that I think a lot about as, as it relates to media is the way that media is infiltrating every business. And what I mean by that, I'll use myself as an example. I'm an investor. The way I make money is that I invest in companies like Twitter. They become successful. Uh, our stock appreciates, and that's how we make money. And uh, what I've been doing as an investor for the, almost the past decade is using technology that Ev invented, logging, and pretending that I'm Michael. Uh, and I, I write a column every single day uh, at abc.com, and uh, about 150,000 people a month um, come to abc.com and read that. These are people who uh, I may want to invest in. It makes it easier for me to invest in them. But, but that's my issue. That's, that relates to my business. But as it relates to media, this is also media that I'm creating. Maybe bad media, maybe good media, maybe mediocre media. But the reality is that as more and more people who have businesses that aren't traditionally seen as media use media to do their business, we have an explosion of media. And I think a lot of media is getting created today that never existed before that is actually very good. And uh, it doesn't need to have a business model. At least it doesn't need to have a traditional business model. And I think that's new and different and important. Fred, just explain that for another 30 seconds when you say it doesn't need to have a traditional business model. Well, I don't need to run advertising on it. I don't need to, uh, I don't need to do any of the things that a traditional publisher would need to do. I don't need to monetize it 
uh, I produce it myself, and... Uh, and it serves another function for you. It, yeah. it serves another function for me, but it is media, and I think there are thousands, maybe tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of people who are doing this now. Uh, and there's a lot of really great media that's getting created. And it's being surfaced up in places like Twitter and Facebook and, and uh, Google Reader and, and other um, aggregators that increasingly are going to filter that down. And, and, and I think it's very challenging for traditional media companies to compete with that. And I think that uh, places like finance and, and technology and, and um, uh, maybe a few other areas are, are where we're seeing that happen most uh, 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 we see it's happening the most right now, but I don't, I don't think it's going to, I don't think any sector is going to be spared from this. Michael. <clears throat> I, th I think one, one of the things that's, uh, that's consistently most interesting to me is our collective inability to grasp the kind of change that we're experiencing. Um, um, well, I mean, we sit in this building, which um, uh, which is mostly occupied by a company that is uh, um, can't fathom the fact that it probably won't be here in the form that it's in um, within a relatively short time. And most of m m most of us here can't fathom that fact. Should be okay these, till the end of the panel, by the way. So don't worry about it. <laughs> that these. Um, that these institutions which we've grown up with and have dominated our business um, no longer will dominate our business. That's, a, that's, a, um, that's simple um, but transformative. Um, we're in the midst of something nothing less than industrial transformation in which everything will change. Not only everything will change, but, um, but all the faces will change. And that's a, that is a, um, that's, that's a key point. The people in charge now will not be in charge. Um, and, um, um, but it's not only a shift in, in, in who's in control, it's in a shift, it's a shift in, um, in um, um, where that power <coughs> flows from. Um, so the most elemental thing that's happened over the last um, uh, decade or last 12 years is, is, is the fact that power has passed to the, um, uh, to the consumer. Um, it's the greatest time in the world for the consu a consumer of, of media. Um, it happens to be the worst time in the world for the providers, the producers, and distributors of, of, of media. Um, we are in this moment in which we've, we've seen um, a, a, a sort of coming apart of the historic partnership between marketing and media. Um, and that's not so much the detriment of marketers, which are finding enormous other ways to to um, uh, to find an audience. Although obviously they have their um, their issues and their problems um, uh, too, but it's devastating to the to the media business. Um, one one of the interesting things I think that's 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 happening now is the war for control of video. Um, it would be impossible to say um, uh, who, who's going to be running the um, uh, the video business. Um, who's going to get the, getting the biggest the biggest piece of the video dollar? Who's going to be um, um, bringing that video into your home or into your um, um, into uh, your laptop? Um, actually, it would be impossible to say what, on what screen that video is going to come. Um, but he who controls um, the video, um, 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 used to be Dick Tracy, and when I was a kid it said, he who controls gravity controls the universe. Um, he who controls video controls the universe. Um, but then it's not only uh, the traditional media business, which is in a state of radical transformation. The new media business is also in a state of radical transformation. Um, so the idea which would have been prevalent um, probably a year ago that Google was unassailable is, um, is, is not an idea that anyone would subscribe to um, anymore. Um, we have suddenly seen the, 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 new, bi the new media business um, in, in a in a, in a, um, a moment where all of these 
fiefdoms or dukedoms or um, um, or imperial new imperial states are are, are rising um, from um, from Facebook to Apple to Netflix to Twitter to um, um, uh, a, a, a company um, that I uh, was actually just at a, at a dinner the other night, this company Spotify, which will shortly come to the U.S. and um, be potentially an iTunes killer. Um, um, I, it's anyway, anyway, it's the most extraordinary and exciting um, period than I could ever imagine, and I'm grateful to be um, um, to be able to make a buck off of uh, telling everybody that they're going to be out of a job. <laughs> Lauren? Um, you know, instead of a death by a thousand paper cuts, this is like a firing squad by nine people, smarty pants. <laughs> so, first of all, traditional news guy, traditional media gal have these analog retardo microphones <laughs> and the cool kids have their <laughs> so I think that's a statement not about alphabetical order the nine bullets out of the assassination team I will let Comcast know that their business model is faulty as soon as I get the legal chance to do so <laughs> I'm glad you're going to make all my content for me and I'm glad I won't ever get any money for it again and have the wrong feeling about who controls video that aside, um, I would say that two things. I think the thing about trends, I'm a t also a long-standing teacher's pet, so I'm going to answer the teacher's favorite question. Um, the phrases of today and the language that drives these kinds of discussion, I'm going to go to a really uh, resilient one that people insist on saying now that's really not relevant today that will be even less relevant, which is, when's it on? And another one that kind of plagues these kinds of panels, and I hope we don't get diverted by the question today, how do you define your company as a media company or a content company? As a media company or a technology company? Not so relevant. It seemed like a new question. It never was. So I think both of those, old school question, new school question, not too relevant today, much less relevant later. And most of all, you know, I think that the conversation is so exciting about trying to predict the future. It's such an unusual time for so many people at so many different levels to be trying to get out in front of what's happening to them today. Um, and the re, you know, I, I, I kind of have this fundamental belief that if you can just look back, you know, maybe a hundred years ago when most people took trains or horses somewhere, and some people had these, you know, you know, clunky things with four wheels and a crank on the front, and the people who made all of that had to decide in advance, you know, am I in the horse and carriage business, am I in the train business, or am I in the business of getting people to the place they want to go, when they want to go, not on my train schedule, easier, don't have to feed the horse, and faster. Car goes faster than horse, not as fast as train, but on my schedule. So I got to decide, I got to convince my current owners and my new soon-to-be owners what kind of business are they in? Are they in the square box on a console business? Are they in the uh, storytelling business? Are they in the most expedient delivery of exciting and dynamic and compelling content business? And that's the story of, of the future. And my last thing is I'm going to um, offer you up a drinking game just for this morning. Water, coffee, or booze if you have it. Anyone who begins their sentence, their answer, with the word so, take a, take a drink. Because I'm not in that digital club yet, and there's a clear line of who's cool and who's not. I'm not yet cool. Anyone who starts their sentence, you'd have four shots down the hatch if you did that game by this answer. <laughs> Could I, could I make a point here? Please. I, I, I think that there's, that there's, that's an interesting metaphor um, um, in terms of industrial transformation, which business are you in? And what we know 
um, largely from the history of industrial transformation is that you can't make that decision is that the business you are in is the business that you are fated to and somebody else because they have different skill sets and different temperament gets to um, um, uh, be um, uh, be the guy who runs the auto business instead of the um, the buggy business. But don't don't we make a little too much out of fate sometimes? I I think we're always saying things are changing. There's this crazy change. We're underestimating the degree of change, and all of that is is true. But the web was around for ten years before you know Evan and Biz started Twitter, before there was a Facebook, or before I think there's a lot of you know, Amazon is a is a e-commerce platform. Is it the perfect e-commerce platform? Is it exactly the right one that has now created the paradigm for every other e-commerce site, or was there some degree of authorship that 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 made that change? So, I, I think there's a, a I think one of the things that is exciting is we're not purely fated to. While the consumer is tremendously powerful. They also still are in the position of getting, even if it starts in a garage, they're the recipients of what's invented. So there, there still is a certain amount of, um, it's, not a, it's not a predestined, predetermined world that we're in. Well, so to the degree that leadership is going to be influential, and certainly the people on the stage are going to play a role in that, it does seem to be a tension between traditional models, which are still remarkably resilient, and these emerging models for content distribution and marketing that we've been talking about. We're, just past the beginning of the television season. It strikes me that those tropes really haven't changed very much. Uh, same kind of programming, same kind of promotion, same kind of adoption by marketers. There's still the need for scale, for common culture, for products we've been consuming for a long time. So listening to this set of opening remarks, you think, well, all of that, you know, forget about it. But in fact, managing the tension between what works now and has worked and what's going to emerge strikes me as an important role for these leaders. What would you say, you know, Laura, uh, um, starting with you, what do you think marketers, I, I guess, do you agree that, or do you feel marketers have moved quickly enough to this new world? And are they leading or following? I won't use the word so. Um, <laughs> we all were going to until you said that. Now we're terribly self conscious. Okay. I wasn't going to, but now I want to. <laughs> okay. I'm going to say so just so that the people can drink it. <laughs> I agree. They missed four shots. <laughs> what is happening now that I believe we're missing is that we, are having, we now need a return to really good marketing. In the early days of marketing, it was about what does a consumer want? What is a consumer doing? How do we best fill that need? Today we get so excited about a new piece of technology or some new behaviors. Really, this should be the most exciting time for marketing. Because what needs to happen is to go back to where is a customer or a consumer on their journey? What is a mom doing all day? You know, what is someone who is leading in the B2B space, whose job it is, is to actually get new leads or new customers for a company. Where are they? What do they need? What content do they want to consume? Whether it's for fun or for entertainment. And we make a lot about this tension when really what should happen is we should go back and say, there are great roles for broadcast media in sharing a mass message, in building brands, in tapping into culture. But there are also incredibly important new ways for us to get inside that journey and understand where someone is as they walk down the street. A phone, a smartphone, is an extension of your body. This is with you all the time. It's a part of where you are, it's a part of how you communicate, it's a part of how you consume. We need to rewrite the customer journeys and say, where are people and how do we create experiences as marketers that will grab them where they are? It's not one thing. 
it's not that simple. Yeah, but uh, but but aren't you uh, essentially saying that? I mean, that's the old way of of, of looking at this. The marketers, um, there's the consumer, the, the customer, the consumer there, and the marketer just has to find a way to give the message. Oh, without, absolutely not. Without acknowledging the fact that that the um, that one of the the messages that has been sent is that the consumer doesn't really want your messages, and the consumer is um, more skilled at avoiding your messages than ever before, and um, um, and the consumer has um, um, is in a state of um, not just rebellion but, but greater savviness than right. you. The mistake is thinking marketing is messages. Marketing does no longer equals messages at all. I, I marketing would, I is would, about inspiring people to engage in whatever way it works for that them. Would we, that's Lauren, what me, we in our my business would call a message, by the way. Right. right. Lauren and then I, I, I would say that um, the whole medium of communication through content going in front of consumers is relatively new, right? Films are about 100 years old. Very new, at most, right? 80 years old, 90 years old. TV is really new. It's not like we're busting, you know, down Euripides and, you know, <laughs> well, plays aren't going to work anymore. It's, it's brand new. So advertising's even newer. And I would argue that the onset of digital, the rise of Web 1.0, set advertising back and set the markets back to the beginning. Because, idiotically, we insisted, the digital world insisted, the market that got created went back to the basis form of advertising, direct marketing, as its paradigm. So a long time ago, people valued 1-800 mattress because it's late at night. That's what you run in late nights. It's cheap, it's easy. People are in bed, and they're like, oh, my mattress is uncomfortable. I'm going to call right now, and I don't have the money, but it's $5 down, and I get a paring knife with it. OK, that's <laughs> ridiculous. But that was the metric of success for a banner ad click-through rates. Oh, I feel like buy, I'm, do, I'm searching sleep problems. If I don't feel like buying a new mattress right now, that ad didn't work and I'm not going to pay you for it. And that's direct marketing, long time, worst advertising on TV. That was the paradigm of digital. So we set back the thing called, you know, you can put bad names on it, you can put good names on it, it's the same words, branding, brand loyalty, marketing, not advertising, but we are all talking about people loving products and new people are going to love new products, some people are going to be loyal to old products, and that was a relationship, a long time relationship, Coke, Pepsi, with your thing that you remember when you're eight years old at your ball game with your dad or, you know, with your, you know, first boyfriend, took a sip, had your first kiss, whatever their thing was to evoke. That was a relationship. So I would argue that the rise of digital set us back in terms of what the market that was created um, at the price it was created for the basest and least effective form of advertising. And now we have to rebuild this relationship and it's not gonna happen overnight because uh, the iterations of it are argued about and a market is created every year in the upfront. Digital has still not entered the upfront market, so no one will bet on a future, right? It's all about futures. It's all scatter. It's all in the, in the quarter. Forget about in the quarter, for the quarter. In the week, for the week, in a granular, low-end uh, form of engagement with consumers. And I, and I think we've got to get way beyond that. Hillary, but I, 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 one, I one second, John. Sorry. Uh, Hillary, go ahead. Uh, I would respectfully disagree. Um, I would say that there is, um, the whole internet is 15 or 16 years old. That's phenomenal. I mean, it's absolutely phenomenal. And the rate at which marketers are embracing this um, is really a lean forward attitude. And the analogy I would draw is that uh, marketers have a historical tradition of really creating the programming that's gonna matter most. So if you think about Procter & Gamble, Procter & Gamble created the soap opera, because when TV came about, they didn't have the uh, medium to really have context that they wanted their message in that would make that emotional connection. And uh, if you look at what the top brands are doing right now, and Laura could talk to this, and I'm sure many others could, is they're really trying to understand the idea that they don't have to reach 
all the consumers, they can reach their consumers, and they know a boatload about their consumers. And so they can begin to think about how do they create the content that is the context that they want to put their brand against. I, I totally agree. To me, that's a different issue. I think it's about life stage, about finding the right people to be advocates for your brand and your product and your content. And they're creating that programming. But, but there's, I, I agree. But there's also I, I'm just about deployment and what the expectation okay. is and the value placed on it in the market called advertising. It's but the, advertising week. It's, the, it's not content week. The, I mean, the, the fundamental point that you, that you just made here, that this is a medium that's 15 or 16 years old, and, 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 and I, I guess your point was it's grown so fast, and, um, but that's not true. Um, that in fact, consumers, it's grown, consumers have used this medium, but marketers have been, have been very wary of it. I mean, the, the, the marketers rushed into television um, at a much faster rate. I mean, and so what? I mean, let's let's get to the nut graph here, which is that we've built a medium, um, which is fundamentally supported by marketing, but it's not such a good marketing medium. It doesn't really work, um, or it doesn't work as well as other mediums have worked, or we haven't found the key to unlock what makes it work. And we're all sitting here, um, both marketers and and, and media people. Um, a, a, a kind of stymied. We don't know how to really make a big buck here. And well, much of the content. That's because we oh, haven't good. tried, right? We're using old-fashioned monetization models in a new medium. When LeBron James writes a tweet that he liked the new Universal Studios movie and Universal Studios goes into Twitter and sponsors that tweet and amplifies it, that's a new way to advertise. That's not an old way to advertise. When we start doing that in this medium at scale, we will find that it works. Putting a banner ad in front of somebody or running an interruption video pre-roll, that's dumb. We shouldn't be doing that. But you know what? LeBron is like television making his... At, when he gives up his MBA salary, that's when you can tell me there's a new market created by his paid no, no, tweet for a movie. No, no, he's not getting paid for that. He watched the movie, he liked the movie, he told his fans he liked the movie. And Someone you, might have slipped him a DVD, is all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> but, but maybe, but I, but, but I write about stuff every day because I want to connect to my audience. He's doing it because he wants to connect his audience. He's not doing it because he's getting paid. And, okay. and, he, and by connecting to his audience, he gets a buck on the jersey that's sold at the NBA store. The guy doesn't like movies that much. And okay, but go ahead. That's that's jump a, in. A, oh, well, one, one, point, one at a time. But, hold on. Michael, hold on one second. Go ahead, Laura. And then we'll get Respectfully, two things have been said that I would like to disagree with. One is that content is not advertising. And I would like to actually put forward a point of view that we have the wrong definition of advertising and that we actually live in a post-advertising world. And it's a world where we have to go to market in different ways. Example, one of the things that Digitas does, we talk to our clients, we say we have to build active brands, not brands. Why is that? Because we don't believe that the world where we could craft a message or even pay someone to do content is the right world. It's a world where the way I consume my content is going to give me a path to feel differently about a brand. And I would argue that the development of content and the way we use content, whether you write it or whether we pay someone to write it, the way as a brand we connect to it, co-opt to it and share it, becomes part of our post-advertising world. I think the challenge admittedly is in the monetization of that for those people who provide content, but as a marketer, since that's not what I think about, I think about how do we do this better for brands, content is very much a part of a post-advertising world, and the fact that we can really cannot say it doesn't work. We have brand after brand that has shifted their dollars into new spaces, who is creating new awareness, creating new connections. We have brands right now that are launching with 100% of their marketing budgets in media that this panel would call new media. I find new media an ironic term. I think it's the media that we are using today. And I believe that as leaders, we are going to have to understand that there is a different definition of engagement and communication that goes into building brands. And that's just what I'd like to add. I, I just you know, want to say that don't forget, I'm, 
I run a huge digital business and my whole world is about innovating inside all media and causing people to seamlessly, without even knowing it, know that they're consuming something that I don't call new media. I think that it's kind of a beautiful vision to be in this post-advertising uh, world. I, I think we're actually not there yet. I think you run a digital agency. So until you run an agency, not a digital agency, and the, it, and the whatever the other agencies are called have, have the same name, you know, we're still working towards it. And the other thing I just want to say, there's, you know, news people and very creative people on this panel. There is something to be said, actually, to not seek to blend all messaging and marketing and advertising with things that were born creatively and for entertainment purposes or for news purposes. So, you know, many other panels are, are, are really, you know, talking about the, these, you know, I guess the social danger, political danger, moral danger of the total blend of messaging and creative content or news content or information content. And I would just, you know, always seek to balance a complete embrace of the new and, and, and innovative and the seamless um, with, with the creative forces that are separated from the economic forces of what many of us do. Well, let's stay on, <coughs> stay on that. <coughs> Pardon me. Let's stay on that for a second. The, um, Michael wrote an influential piece along with Chris Anderson writing a parallel piece a couple of issues ago in Wired about uh, the, the, this trend towards uh, companies that again want to control the experience. I don't want to characterize it for you, Michael, but uh, to what extent are content, is traditional content going to remain really important in this new world uh, that, that we're talking about? Because I agree, I don't think it can all become advertising or even overly blended with advertising. Maybe that's a journalist's perspective. But there does seem to me, maybe backlash is too strong a word, but a trend back towards the opposite of the vision that Fred just shared with us, which is that I, um, that, that AVC is, of course it's a piece of media, but that it's going to be, you know, that everything is going to be like that. I'm not, you weren't really implying that everything would be, but that there'll be all this media and that there'll be filtering devices like, like Twitter, it seems to me that the traditional media players are kind of starting to rise again and become, sort kind of reassert their influence. Well, they're, they're trying. Um, will that be successful? We've seen no indication yet of, of, of anyone who's, who's, um, um, who's um, you know, waved their fist and has gotten something for it. Um, you know, Rupert has decided that, um, um, that he's going to make people pay, and, um, and he's tried that, and you know what? No one is paying. Um, so, um, you know, um, uh, Condé Nast, the company that I uh, work for, is is now um, um, deciding uh, or has is pursuing with some um, intent and enthusiasm um, this idea that that people will um, take to reading their magazines in essentially the the same as they've always been, but in now suddenly available on in tablet form. Um, will that work? Um, it's totally unclear. I would, my personal bet would be that it, that it won't work. Um, that people want, that the, that the fundamental experience, that the idea that we are now doing, this, what we're engaged in, is, is, um, is, is essentially filming theater for um, a video experience and that was a failure as a video experience. Paul, so, Paul can, you, can you speak to this? You certainly have to wrestle with this issue because you have a very well, successful business that is yeah. now... Yeah, but I think, I, I mean, I just touch on a couple of things. We are still in the, a world where 30% of the average person's time is spent online and 13% of marketing dollars are online. So that gap is going to narrow, whether you like it or not, it's going to narrow. Well, how come it hasn't narrowed so far, though? Yeah. I mean, well, it, it has. Happened, the graph it has, is it growing, happened but it's much quicker in the television business, and that those numbers have been pretty stable now for several years. There is some. There is a point of resistance here, which we haven't um, adequately analyzed, and certainly have not yet. Well, overcome. I'll leave that to the agency world to answer that, or marketers to answer that. But my view would be that actually, it's about how you scale up lots of st small ideas around tweeting and, and blogging and everything else. But, um, so, you know, we do a lot of experimenting online and you get seven people who buy something. Well, you know, that's not going to change your business. When I can send out 20 million bits of direct mail, 
and get 7,000. So I think there's a, there's a challenge about how you scale up some of these smaller things. But to me, it fundamentally comes back to brands. And whether you are a blogger on ABC, you still have a brand. You have a personal brand, and you have a brand that's giving you permission to talk to an audience. So I think this idea you know, of content, and you know, it's about brands. If I deliver an economist video, or an economist audio, or an economist iPad app, and it's coming before anyone asks me in November, um, if I deliver that, it has to be as good as The Economist. I can't, there's no difference to me, but what people are buying is the brand, and they have to pay to engage with the brand. So I think brands are important. And then just, you know, lastly, we don't go and sell advertising anymore. We don't sell advertising. We sit down and talk about taking marketing budget share. So we have conversations. There's probably, you know, if I look at, a, if 100% of our advertising pitches two years ago were about print, now, 50% are about print, and everything else is about a combination of eight other things. Events, social media, Facebook, you know, all these things are part of every conversation we're having. So the world is changing, because we have to compete for marketing dollars as a, as a media brand. And I think of ourselves as a media company, and not just advertising dollars, which a year ago we were absolutely doing that. Well, um, oh, go, uh, go ahead, Trevor. Oh, I was just going to say, it's a strange assumption to say that the amount of time somebody spends in a given medium and the amount of advertising dollars we allocate to that medium should be exactly parallel, right? Certain media are good for doing certain stuff, right? So TV is great and TV commercials can be really entertaining and there's nothing really wrong with that and that's a much better place. It'd be really irresponsible as an advisor to my clients if I said, you know, really a Coca-Cola style brand, a fast moving consumer good product should really should really spend a ton of money online because in some cases they can come up with very clever tactics. We can do a lot on their behalf to 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 do things often farther down the purchase funnel, right? When you're interested in consideration and sampling and retention and all the things that we do sort of later on in that customer journey or the customer relationship that, that Laura talked about. But to say, you know, some of the branded content models people talk about or to, to really move too much money into that too soon, it's not necessarily a good idea because, you know, when we run an ad for, when we're doing marketing for Dell, I was saying over breakfast, you know, if we can run an ad on CNET that says to somebody who's in market for a PC, you can buy an Inspiron now for $499, that's enormously effective. It doesn't mean that I think they shouldn't do other forms of traditional advertising that have also worked for them in the past or overweight one just because people are spending more time there. Moreover, as a consumer, I, you know, I don't necessarily want advertising in every part of my life. So for example, Facebook, I think, was not designed to be a particularly effective advertising medium. I don't think advertising was in Mark Zuckerberg and everybody else's head when they made that up. I think we have to live with that. I think that's okay. Evan, you've been listening thoughtfully. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 your, your company is sometimes described as a social network or as a media company. What, what, what are your thoughts about this? As Certainly marketers are eyeing Twitter with great interest and yes. Red Side are a dramatic example of, uh, of LeBron James, one of right. many more to come, I'm sure. So Twitter wasn't designed as an advertising medium, but it's not a social network. It's, it's commercial messages fit very well in Twitter because it was designed as a one to many publishing system. And from the beginning, there have been companies on there who have recognized it's a very useful way to get a message to their constituents. And so we feel very good about the position we're in because people are opting in to essentially advertisements in mass numbers on Twitter because it, it relates to what I was saying earlier about the advertisements actually being helpful and, and respectful. They're about delivering useful information in a concise and immediate way that helps people make better choices. And so Dell is on Twitter and a million people opted in to get their special outlet deals because it's useful information. But lots of other people <clears throat> sign up for stuff that's less uh, direct response and much more branding like because they care about Starbucks and Starbucks can send these little branding messages to them on a daily basis, multiple times a day basis, that 
are just make them feel something about Starbucks or remind them of Starbucks and ask them questions about Starbucks and get them to engage and maybe retweet and tell their friends about it. That is a, that is a new and compelling thing. Most of that we're making no money off of. So that's the that's thing we're figuring out. The promoted tweets when people want a, lot, a little lift for these messages is, is useful um, and that's how we're making money. But there's a tremendous amount of marketing and, and advertising going on in a medium that is opt-in and, and helpful to, to consumers and sits alongside the, the use model is exactly the same as the content, the entertainment, the friend messages and everything else. And I don't know if that's possible in other mediums, but, but that blend is there and it's, it's, it works. Can we, can we talk about mattresses again? Please. <laughs> so um, so it, it's easy as a marketer, as a client, to, um, to be enamored with the, uh, the characteristics of, of high-level advertising and to talk about branding as if it's an end to itself. But when you sit down with shoppers and you talk about their needs and what they're trying to accomplish, um, you know, that the infomercial serves a lot of really important needs, as does something as particular as, as letting me know that the, the local Starbucks um, is doing some special or they have an, an entertainment in, in a local way. This idea that somehow direct marketing is, is a low form of, of advertising that should be discounted in the, in the face of brands, I, I, I guess shoppers reject. And as, as an ex-retailer ex who did a lot of really low form of advertising, I'm embarrassed to say, um, I, 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 think, I think I think we, we, we got to step back and, and look at what the consumer is saying. So, um, <coughs> The, the needs that I have today as a shopper, when I'm making a decision, I've got to spend my, give up my money, certainly compounded by the economy. But it's also more than that, right? The shopper walks in today with a laundry list of guilt-ridden, angst-ridden uh, behaviors they bring with them. Is this product um, environmentally responsible? Um, what are the economic uh, indications of, of, of this? Am I, am I Am I employing some um, underage child in, in India? Is that a good thing? Or the fact that they're working in this factory, is that a bad thing? Um, what, are, what are the environmental issues with the product and how do I dispose of it? And certainly the health and safety issues when, when, I, when I put this product onto the dinner table or, or hand it off to my children. And so you've, you've got this incredibly lonely decision that's driven with so much more information, that's driven by so much more, more paranoia about making a great choice. And if a 30-minute infomercial at night helps me learn more about the bed, or that tweet gives me an, 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 an indication of what's going on in my local marketplace, man, I'm going to subscribe to that because that made me sh smarter in the moment. I From agree. Just, on the media. just one, one more comment. Just one more comment. So, <laughs> um, it's, it, if, 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 I, if I step, step back and look, look at, 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 at the utility, there's so much uh, going on in utility in terms of new technology. If I look at the utility and, and the value that it drives in the moment, and, I, and I, it's very easy to point to some sort of iPhone application and say, that's utility, that's, that's giving me information in the moment. If I step back and look at the shopper's journey end to end as just shopping, right, it's not like we think of it like pre-shopping and there's direct mail and then there's the low form of advertising like the packaging in the store and the hideous wobbler on the, on the retailer shelf. But if I look at that as an as end-to-end gestalt and, I'm, and, and the experience that the shopper goes as they go, they go I, I don't know what I need to do. And at the end of this, I've, I've made a decision. To the extent that new media can, can help empower and inform and wrap that experience, man, we've got a winner. Well, from, from the media point of view, this is the problem. Direct marketing is low margin. It has never given us enough, um, essentially enough profit to create content. So direct marketing only pays for marketing. Brand marketing pays for something much larger and we get to make um, uh, great television shows and good magazines. And the environments that ultimately lead to um, high margin marketing. So what we've done by this, by creating this, this, this direct medium, is we've lowered everybody's opportunities. Um, you can only sell, um, you're, you're, you're selling in a low margin situation and we're getting low margin dollars. So we've, we've, we've um, it is, we've created again one of those, those sort of faded things to. Um, what, what I, Hillary and then Lawrence. Yeah, I would, I would just say, whoa, dude. 
you're painting the life of a shopper that's pretty heavy. I don't feel that way. <laughs> I, I feel like, wow. Um, I feel it's so liberating. I mean, the number one thing consumers have is they're, they're time starved. And all of a sudden, you have this ability with services like Twitter and mobile devices to, you know, when I'm driving home and my son informs me he needs a new lacrosse stick, and I have no idea where to get a lacrosse stick to real time understand, you know, how do I find a store that has it? How do I get there? Um, it knows my location. And I feel empowered. You shouldn't be using your phone while you drive. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 illegal in the, it's illegal in the state of California, so of course I'm not doing it. I'm asking my son to do it. Um, but but what, what I would say is that, you know, I feel like it's, it's, it's so freaking empowering. I mean, I feel like the ability to really um, take so much of the agony, um, and the reality is, um, you, you can get so much more done and for marketers to be thinking about how to take advantage of um, that real time and, and I think this is kind of a this uh, I don't know it this Faustian debate of is, is it is it performance or is it brand or is it you know do I want to drive traffic to the stores most marketers that are out there that have major budgets it's yes and yes and yes they want to build a brand they want to drive performance um, because they have some metrics, and most of them want to drive some kind of an action. So um, it's all of it. Lauren? Um, so, I, I was just going to add um, an, another way of looking at this shopper marketing thing, which, by the way, is absolutely a fascinating new world of uh, consumer <laughs> insights and behaviors that go way beyond this thing called the demographic, which is over and, you know, really takes the newer form of that, which you guys referred to before, you know, the life stage approach, which is right on. But as people become better shoppers, because there's more choice, uh, I, I run this group at NBCU called the Women in Lifestyle Entertainment Group. And we do a tremendous amount of uh, insights work on women in particular. And the, the stunning set of facts that I'm sure you guys all know is 85% of all consumer purchasing power, absolute dollars, in the United States today are driven by women. And it's clearly not just in the grocery aisle, you can't get to that number with that. It's technology, auto purchasing, financial services, financial planning, et cetera. And the best thing about the, the overwhelmed woman, mother, taking care of a sick parent, um, working, uh, almost outnumbering men in the workforce, everybody's working, recession, is that most women are willing to do a lot of homework. And they like to be informed. And again, I just, you can't blame or credit the technology. If the care circle, the sewing circle, whatever it's been for a long time, that circle just got a lot bigger in a hurry. And they're not afraid to ask for advice. And when they get their opinion, best stat out of the 85% stat is when women decide, at the moment they decide they like that product, the first thing they do is not decide to buy it. 96% of those women who can identify that time that they decide to like the product want to tell, quote unquote, everyone they know that they like the product. And that's such an open way that I would just say that direct marketing now works both ways. And that works. We're, we're in violent agreement, absolutely. Right? So, so it just, it's just an evolution and I just wouldn't get stuck on the thing. Um, you know, we, we did, uh, I'm actually getting a lot of research from iVillage, which has this passionate, 30 plus million unique audience a month. That's a lot of women. 20,000 brand mentions a month on iVillage. We, we went and found out all about that. But our best and most innovative partnerships as big, old, soon to be dead, moribund media has been with Twitter. The gr groundbreaking first in, first to the table, first media brand on Twitter, first media brand on Foursquare. So, I'm just saying don't blame or credit the, the technology at that moment. You know, do what you're supposed to do. Whatever you feel like you've been put on the face of the earth for, go serve it wherever it is. So I, I, I just think that the whole shopper marketing thing and the, and the technology is so fantastic, but, you know, maybe not the beginning and the end. 
I think one of the things we've all touched on without being explicit is the notion of digital data. We've talked a lot about how we want to market in this new age or what the role media plays, but one of the most interesting things we now have in front of us is an extraordinary amount of digital data. We're not online anymore, we're digital. Whether that digital is the way we use our phones or ultimately interactive television, it's going to be very difficult to distinguish digital and non-digital as we go forward. It's more a question of how we want to use that information to make our efforts more meaningful or create value in that digital data chain. Example, we talk about a customer journey. It's not really a sequential, you know, I become aware, I consider, I buy. It's more like the term in mathematics, a random walk where I might hear about something, I might go talk to my friends, I might go have some fun, later on I might actually buy it without even thinking about it. How do we as marketers and as media understand that new random walk? How do we use the data that all of us collectively have about everything from what people are searching on all the way to what people are tweeting, to what people are reading, to what people are writing? Because the next generation of how we create value is going to be to take that data wherever it comes from and use it to inform the way we spend our time and the way we create experiences in virtual real time. And I don't believe this distinction of old and new media is going to remain relevant. It's going to be the way we take all of our channels and take our digital insight and data and ultimately make that connection. It's not direct marketing, necessarily. It could be building my brand because I've identified who's really interested in that product somewhere else. You know, I, I think what's one, one thing that, that Lauren said that really rang true to me was this notion that the lifestyles we're living today are so hectic and so full that, you know, the knitting circle and the book club and, you know, the, the coffee time uh, among women um, are not happening as much. And those conversations have moved online. And those conversations are public now. So it gets back to uh, the comment about more data. So those conversations are actually exist. They exist in the forums in iVillage. How many brand mentions? Uh, 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 over 20,000 a month. Because think about that, 20,000 a month. And, and I don't know if you're doing this yet. I hope you are. Uh, um, is if you could Turn those brand mentions into marketing opportunities for those brands, even if they're negative brand mentions, just to be part of those conversations. Could never do that before. A brand could never show up in, at the, at the knitting, knitting circle and say, I'm here now, let's be part of this conversation. I think that's huge and that's native to the medium. That's not running a banner ad, that's not running a pre-roll. And that, I think, is, is where the action is. I, I will say that yesterday we announced um, this thing called the Women at NBCU Brand Power Index. And it's probably very clumsy and you know we just we were overwhelmed by this incredible and unique set of data that is the first time we've experienced it. So we sought to make an index, just a market mover index of the the old thing called word of mouth. And uh, one one data stream is person to person actual word of mouth that we can capture. Um, online mentions, right? Just straight up web 2.0 mentions. And the third data stream is social media mentions. So these are the three newish ways outside of the book club, knitting circle, care circle, that we found were the most consistent and high powered data streams. And we indexed them and just made a list of the most mentioned and the, the, the quickest movers up or down, because you want to know why all of a sudden something is going up or down. And the first, first of all, we announced it and the top 20 brands called. And said, so why am I number X? And am I up or down? And what are they saying? And the greatest piece that Fred points to is that a couple of years ago, people were loath to enter the space because of the fear of lack of control, right? Well, what if they say something bad? What if I plunk this new thing, this new can of whatever product into the um, you know, online knitting circle and they hate it. 
And the thing that I think marketers and product people and human beings have gotten to a point of is saying, I can have a dialogue with this hateful product. And if you can convert me back even a little bit, then you don't even have like a fast mover up the, up the index. You have a brand proselytizer who will be like a virus in the positive way to then tell those, you know, the, that, right. that whole circle how they feel. Uh, well, problem. this is, this is all, all great. I mean, this is a great vision and direct is a, is a great vision and, and, and relationships are a great vision. All this sounds great. How come nobody's paying for it? I mean, let's get to the bottom here, and the bottom, I mean, the real issue is that we can define the hell out of this and define the advantages of it, but in the marketplace, the market is saying, this is not really worth, this is certainly not worth so, yeah, so, what so, it used to be So let's worth. stay on that. So Fred, I was that, actually going to point that, to you. I, I don't think that, that that's exactly what's going on. You don't have to pay for it, okay? That's what's, the truth is, that so much of this opportunity is free if you just participate in the medium. It's what Ev said, right? Most of the advertising that happens on Twitter is free because the marketers don't have to pay for it. Think about Craigslist, okay? What? Craigslist is a $100 million business, wildly profitable, and it has basically collapsed the $16 billion classified ad industry. Why? Because most of what's on Craigslist is free. You don't need to pay okay, for it. And that's right. That's but it's not, that's, it's not that's a reasonable it's not view free. of this. It's not free because I don't think that marketing budgets are going up. CEOs aren't giving CMOs more money. And as a CMO, you're sitting there saying, I now have to do this stuff, but there's no, I'm not necessarily writing a check, but I need people. I'm employing agencies. So this idea that it's free, there is opportunity cost in that. So I don't think it's a completely... <laughs> I think you're right. But I think what's happened is that we, the, just we move from media buys to media execution. So the dollars are flowing to a different place, and we're seeing it as the dollars aren't flowing. But they're flowing. They're just flowing differently. Well, well that, if, even if this is true, that it works without, without, um, um, at, a, at a much lower cost, I mean, we still have an economic conundrum here of a business that that was that that used to be this big and is now this big which which sort of says we all ought to get out of it because it's a sh it's it's shrinking um, and also it it, it it sort of I mean it it says something really profound about the future which is that we don't have a growing business we don't have um, um, something that is going to replace what 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 was that we're involved in a um, in a transformation to, um, um, certainly for the media business, to uh, nowhere. But Michael, didn't the media <laughs> business at a certain point say, right, when the first banner ad ran in Wired magazine, wasn't that the media business to an extent saying, this is all about the content and content is king, to, to, to Andrew's point, right, and we're going to have this big page of text and this little tiny banner ad at the top. And then now, fast forward to several years later, we're saying, gee, the web isn't a great advertising medium in the way we'd ideally like. The dollars aren't flowing. Well, if I look at a print copy of Wired, it's a really good advertising medium. They're big, full-color ads. But there's no equivalent in the experience, the web experience of reading Wired. Well, OK, so let's, in other words, what, what, what you're saying is that the people who have created this new medium um, have for some reason not been able to respond to um, um, marketing exigencies to create something yeah. that 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 really works and so in that I mean in that regard it's it's true all other media has been created by marketers and, and um, suddenly this this media is creating created by technologists to your point about about Facebook I, well and um, editorial not set up as well, an well, advertising well, can media. I, I, I think we should just get them back straight we talk about um, digital media isn't growing it's just not true it's not true so if you just look at the facts uh, of the situation all other media, if you go back and you look at the last several years, I'm talking about the U.S., probably is true on a global basis, is uh, percentage of eyeballs going to other media is going down. Percentage of eyeballs going to digital is going up. 
if you look at how they're spending their ad budgets, their ad budgets are going down in other media, they're going up in digital. So, I mean, we can talk about the fact that share isn't shifting, well, yeah, but, but it is but shifting. Going up, but per eyeball, they're spending less. Yeah. So, that, I mean, that's, that's the that, crucial metric yeah, there. And total media consumption is going up. So I wouldn't parse it like there's, the, the thing that is so transformational is that people think that these 24 hours in a day is one pie chart driven by sleeping and media, right? That's always how we break up <laughs> my PowerPoint slides. There's sleeping and then there's media consumption. And so you need, you need Venn diagrams now, okay, in, in, in my boardroom charts. And so total media consumption is going, I, I, w I went to the Yankee game on Saturday, they lost, it's terrible. But in Yankee, the new Yankee Stadium, there is awesome, national, decades old, beautiful brand advertising, and there's Joe's Hardware Store, Frank's Bank, and 1-800-MATTRESS, right? It's just the perfect, like you get 55,000 people, many of them are the same, every game, and you have the biggest and the most local. And I think that that balance has, you know, just, just you know, our television advertising hasn't changed too much either. I, you know, very few people ever thought, like, I won't have four commercial pods an hour. I'm just going to do one big one. The, no one ever is, did that. This is why the only place media people can really go on vacation is Cuba. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is going to be, <clears throat> how are you going to finance great content in this model that we're talking about? Let's so shift a little bit here. Well, I think uh, what I see my kids doing is buying a lot of television. Um, and I'm not suggesting that, that the television is going to become a totally paid product because I don't think that's true. And I think, as many people have said, television advertising is fantastic. You know, you can tell a message, you know, in television that you can't tell uh, in any other medium. But I also see my kids just going and buying shows on iTunes or, you know, watching movies on Netflix um, and they're paying for that experience. And I really believe that we're going to see more and more of that kind of behavior. I think these subscription models are going to work. Um, maybe not in newspapers, don't know about magazines, but I definitely think in video content, expensive, highly produced, high quality content, even inexpensive, high quality content, yes. uh, people will pay for it. I yeah, think you know, but I, even that model, that's going to be a, a, a troubling model because even if they do pay for it, you're not going to achieve the levels that the, the the revenue levels that we achieved when these were mass market advertising opportunities. It depends who you mean when you say we. Right. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of components to the we. Um, I, I view it as you know more 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 societal than the dollars to dimes argument or the you know social media versus new media whatever that means marketplace. I view it as, I think a lot of us have kids of varying ages on this panel and, uh, you know, our kids may not be 100% representative of the country's kids or the world's kids, but we have this little sample and we have to engage with them all the time and that's why we, I know as an iVillage runner now that moms are actually the fastest adopters to media because they got to keep track of those kids. Where are you? Tell me. Show me. I'm going to pick you up at 3.15. But the societal element is the phrase back to one of the setup questions. I think the phrase for the future is that these kids are addicted to choice, right? And if you can capture an addiction in society, you're, you're the pusher man, right? And the old adage on the schoolyard is you give them a little taste for free and then you got them. So I think that right now we're testing giving them a little taste for free, but they're addicted to the office. So they gotta buy it on Hulu. It, you know, there's an argument, is it $1.99 or 99 cents on iTunes? You know, whatever the argument is, the fact is that this addiction to choice is the new market and everyone will get in line as a content creator. And of, of course, addiction to choice is a, is a contradiction. It means you're not addicted. I mean, this is you're like, just that's addicted the to. Your, you have a no, no, Michael. Problem. They are addicted. They are addicted. They're addicted to choice. They want that show on their laptop, so that it's with them wherever they are when they want to watch it. They are addicted to the show. I can assure you. Control might be a better and word, I, actually. And Bob. I think it's also about 
uh, time and a sense of time. It's not just choice. It's about wanting what I want, exactly where I want it, and when I want it. I, I don't I'm, mean choice by what right. is it. I mean when, where, what, if, so, but how. But the rituals and are changing. This is right? all the great, and this is all true, and this is all a byproduct. I mean, one of the, the great byproducts of technology, but it's not good for a business model. Choice is bad for media in terms of media making uh, making as much money right. as it I mean, possibly right. can. I mean, another, way to, another way to say that is that I'm sorry, you know, there's been a comfortable oligopoly that essentially has been the working model for content creators and marketers for decades, and now that oligopoly is yeah. sort of threatened it, it, and crumbling. It's, it's like the music business. Music business has never been better for bands than right now. It's terrible for record companies, but guess what? They were incredibly inefficient, right? Sure. I pay for ESPN. I'm not a sports fan, right? I pay for that and I subsidize everybody else's watching of ESPN. How long can that go on? Evan? Well, the, the choice question thought about another way is the reason, of course it's not gonna work as well because People didn't have a choice before but to sit back and watch the TV commercial. And now they're not only buying content, they're TiVoing it. And given the choice, they'll skip the damn commercials. They don't like those as much. And given that there's infinite media to consume, they're not going to waste time on stuff they don't want. And that's the marketing messages. So it, that's just a fact. They're no longer a captive audience. So yeah, it's going to make less money. But I think when you think about it, it really, um, we've talked about paid versus not paid. And we talk about highly produced video and entertainment. I think consumers have always thought that they paid for that. They went to the movie theaters. They were paying for that. I think when it comes to news. Well, they, they, they didn't think that on, on network television. Uh, they did on network television, but Since I think the dawn that, of cable, though, they've been paying for Yeah, but they've been paying in different modes. I would say there's a big distinction. I'm trying to make a different distinction, which is between um, entertainment content and news and information, where I think for the most part, consumers have always felt that they were paying for the delivery to their doorstep or they were paying for the magazine to be delivered to their homes. And so there's not a consumer mindset that they've been paying for that. Now, what's interesting about it in terms of to your point, they want to skip the advertising. If you look at most of the women's magazine, the most popular issue is the September magazines. Why is it the most popular issue? It has the most advertising, and people are actually buying those magazines. My husband will say to me, why, that's all ads. And my point is, you're exactly right. You know, I, I want to see those ads. And so I think as we think about these models and, and where it works and where it doesn't work is, um, you know, where, where will they pay? Where is the advertising so compelling to me that um, you know I'm actually buying something to get those ads? Yeah, but, but I, I have to interrupt. The September the issue of Vogue, the September issue, the famous September issue, now a beautiful movie. I think that that is just a classic media chicken and egg thing. The there's more advertising in it because it editorially covers the trends for the year, so it, it gained more, I mean, that's what, and that's also what Sunday has, would say. And also it has say. more readers in it, too. So advertisers are going to, to the readers, but, not but, the other but, way but, around. But, but, but the consumer likes it. Right, I'm saying that, that there's no barrier just because it's thicker right. because of ads and the same number of editorial pages, there's no barrier to that. But, um, I, I would also just say that there is something amazing about the power of consumers, which is that people don't buy the cheapest of everything. Right? Poor people have to. Recession struck people do more. But, you know, having built many businesses on the absolutely arbitrary and, and fungible and sometimes, not often, manipulatable vagaries of consumer behavior, nobody needs a $700 pair of shoes. Not one person in the whole world needs a $700 pair of shoes. You should buy. 70 pairs of shoes for 10 bucks, obviously. So, uh, obviously. So I'm saying there's also, like, people pay for stuff at different times in, in, in industrial and consumer behavior times that don't really make any sense. Sometimes it's quality, sometimes it's beauty, sometimes it's advertising, sometimes it's because a big star carries it. And so you want to put all these consumers into boxes. It's when they surprise you and lead you that is often helpful to look at. Uh, so Laura, one quick second. <clears throat> we're, we're in the home stretch, so we do want to take some questions from, from you. So 
we'll let Laura make her point, and then we do have a couple of microphones. So if you would be brave enough to raise your hand and ask a question, you're on deck. Go ahead. Uh, often now, people talk about paid, owned, and earned media. We have not mentioned it yet this morning. Paid being that which I bought and I could get my reach or my eyeballs. Owned being the places where I, as a marketer, could actually connect. For example, it might be my own website, it might be my own email list, it might be anything that I could control. And then earned, which is those things that, um, there are many definitions, but whether it's word of mouth or social or things that are, are shared. And one of the challenges I believe we all have as marketers is how do we think about allocating investment of people and marketing dollars across these? Because they are no longer discrete. And as we think about how we are going to connect with consumer behavior, it's a combination. The financial models and economic models of the paid part of the media equation have to change. But how valuable owned and earned are and how they work together is going to be an important part of how that value is recreated as we go forward. And I think that all of us are going to be learning how to bring those together in different ways. They're no longer discrete. And I think that's a really important part of how we are going to be marketing. Okay, we had some, wait one second, sir, to get a microphone, please. If you wouldn't mind identifying yourself, and uh, if there's somebody particularly want to ask, answer the question, say so. Yeah, sure. Hi, my name is Tom Kurz, and I'm a co-publisher of the EscapistMagazine.com. Um, we're sort of the games and geek culture rag in the uh, new media space. So my question, or I guess comment, goes first out to uh, Michael, who I'm a big fan of, and uh, but you know to the whole panel, I guess, for comment. And that is that I think in the past, advertising dollars. Um, spent on television or on billboards or on magazines have been driven by traffic, really just traffic, like, you know, how many people are tuning in and how many people are driving by a billboard or what have you. And so you have this uh, internet medium created by technologists and, uh, uh, and all of a sudden we have technology companies going out there and saying, well, we're going to tell you how advertising works. And so we're judging advertising uh, in a way on the internet in ways that we don't judge advertising for any of the other mediums. And so people go ahead and they spend money in the mediums where they don't have to explain why or show results. And then at the same time, we're looking for results uh, from internet advertising that really don't reflect how people use the advertising. So I, I think you have a situation where the money hasn't accelerated into the online space at the same way that it was with other mediums because we're calling this new medium uh, to the mat and asking them, asking, you know, uh, online uh, uh, ads to behave in a way that we haven't asked of anybody else. And uh, so, you know, if we accept the adage that 90 or 95 percent of advertising blows, and then we go ahead and we say, oh, and we also have to measure its success online. It just takes a little longer for it to, uh, I, I think, for the dollars to go. And we still haven't figured out, you know, what's the best way to message online. But uh, it's clear to me the money has to go there. I just think we're holding it. And, and, and it's the agencies and, and the technology companies that I actually think need to take a look at what are we really doing to ourselves. Uh, why are we holding ourselves hostage by this sort of uh, uh, measurement that we don't that we don't use for anything else? So, if anybody wants to comment on that, well, one, one of the interesting things is is that we've we've also um, we jerry rigged this this um, this notion of of eyeballs. I mean, this notion of eyeballs. Um, um, and of measured audiences comes from old media, and then we've adapted it into this new media in which we have all of these um, uh, new techniques and, and I think questionable techniques of moving audiences. So we suddenly have, um, have most of our audiences visiting. Most brands are there because they, they don't know why they're there. They, they've there because, because Google suddenly put them there. So they don't know why they're there. They don't know where they are. Um, they don't know what they're reading. They don't know what kind of context this is. Um, um, the, the entire experience is, um, 
um, is, ha, becomes an atomized one. Um, so we're delivering these audiences that are, I would argue, um, fundamentally low, low, low value audiences. Uh, you, you, you but, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. No, I think that, you know, why do we do it? Because we can. I mean, you know, why do we have this measurement system? Because we can. But the challenge for media companies to me is that, and this is back to the economic model, we need content to put that ad over to get the click. What you're starting to see, and that we've sort of touched on, on um, branded content, but you're, you're going to see it with news, I think, is that effectively, as media owners, you want the news that's going to generate the most clicks. So do you start creating content and going into different directions because you're driven by this metric as well? So I think there's a slightly more dangerous problem in terms of as media owners and thinking of, of content. And there's a very interesting company called Demand Media, which absolutely takes this, this algorithm thought to its end conclusion, which is we will only write things that will give us a higher ranking and a higher click um, and those websites. are all people, and we've tricked everyone to come because because we've SEO'd the hell out of this, and that's our well, real. I'm not sure it's a ideas. trick, but yeah. you know, if someone's searching something and that's at the top, for whatever reason, right? But well, you hire a cheap freelancer who puts Lindsay Lohan in the headline, and that's your business model. Well, what, one of the interesting things is, it all sounds so diabolical to me. I actually want to just come back to the idea that um, there's a lot of goodness in it for the consumer now. So if you just take the real-time information we have at Yahoo, we can tell during the Olympics what people are searching on. So if it's uh, downhill racing and there's a lot of red marks on the snow and they're really trying to understand what that's about, we can see it in the searches. So all of a sudden you have an ability to real time be able to surface the content that people care most about. Uh, we recently acquired a company, Associated Content, which has 390,000 contributors. And it's a, um, it's an assignment desk in which we can create the assignments. There's both real editors as well as a set of algorithms that help us understand the quality of what's created. And so when you think about a consumer who now wants really relevant experience, they want the most relevant um, news, sports, finance, and entertainment, which we can give them the headlines and we can yeah, deliver yeah, but for they them. Have but to what, what, them what, content. What, they have to trust you. Well, you I, I, it comes back to the time. You're argue. just basing the whole experience. And so, and so what, <laughs> what we're doing is creating a medium which is um, which is not going to return for us because everybody's going to going to say, you know, if it's, if it's relevant to me, if it's relevant to me, and you're giving me information I care about, uh, and the way brands get created. So let's just take Fred Listen, Slott I can see. I, I know how fast those people leave that stuff, and it's not relevant to them, and they don't want it, and they they're not. <laughs> no, note, the, note the last vestiges of civility crumbling in the waiting moments. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tre tre Trevor, yeah, well, what? you said you said a, you said in your question um, something like 90 percent or 95 percent of advertising blows, and you also brought up data. Look, I, I would say some advertising blows more than others, right? So, so if, if, if you take that as a given and you actually look at data about what advertising people like and don't like, by the way, I would warrant 99% of branded content blows. I would right? advocate that 90 to 95% of everything blows. Yeah, so good high. point. <laughs> But I, I think you have to, what, what, what frustrates me and what I kind of keep th throwing at, at Michael and, and to a lesser extent Paul is the, the idea that in some media, the difference between the September issue of Vogue and everything else we're talking about, and there's no black market, right, in copies of Vogue with all the ads ripped out, is that Tom Florio, and I presume whoever his successor is, I don't know, really curates that group of ads. He, he actually considers it part of the editorial product. On television, people spend a fortune on broadcast graphics, on shows, on branding the network, on advertising the network, but when the ads come on, too many television broadcasters throw their hands up and say, well, that's not part of what we're meant to control or influence. Same thing happens on the web. There's sort of a slot there, and whatever the ad serving company pushes in there is what winds up there, and too few online publishers say, how do I make 
advertising with my advertising partners in here that's going to be entertaining and have value to my user base. If that would happen, I think we'd feel a lot less that it blows. And if you look at data, consumers actually tend to like richer, more animated, more interactive, higher bandwidth advertising. They hate banner ads, but we don't really react to that on the publishing side as much as we should. Fred? Are you, are no, I, 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 I don't have anything to add. I'm to sorry. I thought I, I, saw you, <laughs> I, I thought I saw you a lean forward position uh, over here. The, yes, go ahead. Um, so You're on. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to mention the company I'm with. My name's Sam. Hi, everybody. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have to. Uh, I have to say that um, this gentleman over here mentions that. Um, there, that we're being forced to measure online advertising in, in a way that's not exactly. Uh, the way the user responds, and, and just just in, as, a, as an example, you know, people talking about how everybody hates these banner ads. Um, my my company gets behind the data and actually looks at this stuff, and people don't hate banner ads, and people actually do respond. I think the the agencies are doing a horrible job responding to it. We're actually seeing the data and presenting to the companies um, and their clients. And, um, and, the, and the question is. Uh, I, I, I guess the I guess the question is is what what realm maybe uh, the the uh, the Laura from C, from uh, Digitas can answer. Well, what what ways are you guys going to to answer with the data and to give these clients a better um, understanding of what's going on um, from their advertising online? I'm sorry. A um, couple of answers to that question. There were several things in it. The first one is, what are we doing with data to make the entire advertising experience more valuable and have more impact? And I hear two lines of discussion. One is, how do I make it more entertaining? How do I make it more interesting for me as a consumer? And the other is, how do I make it work better for an advertiser? Because one of the dirty little secrets everyone in this room knows is sometimes advertising does not have to be entertaining to work. Right? It just has to be very specific and very direct. And we may not like it, it may not be creative, it may not look beautiful, but it works. And I think for all of us in the industry, our challenge is as follows. We still have to make it work. And we have data that we've now automated. In fact, one of the things that is possible now, and Digitas um, is, is out in the forefront of this, is to take all of this data that's so overwhelming bring it together in an automated fashion and pull out those things that really matter so you can make a different marketing decision. But more interesting is to say, how do I use that same data to understand what matters to people so that I can actually create and often dynamically create different kinds of content? Some of which I will be paying for very specifically as branded content that's developed and some of which I may have already. And I'm just going to reassemble it in a very dynamic way. And we are doing that today for many of our clients. So for example, something we did in the early days with Yahoo for Delta Airlines. We knew based on who was searching or who was visiting a certain site where the travel patterns of those people were, whether they were Delta Sky Miles members, so that we could actually serve to them information in a banner ad about a fare sale. If you lived in the Northeast, a cheap flight from New York to Orlando, something very relevant. Changed the economics of Delta Airlines, and it actually changed the value that people saw in the advertising. Because advertising is often a service. It is not always a push message. So the short answer is data is going to unlock a next generation of creativity. Data is going to have to be managed because there's too much of it. We won't be able to act. We'll be frozen. And so we're going to have to say, how are we going to take that data, automate it, and use it, which is something that that, as you mentioned, Digitas is in the forefront of. And ultimately, how are we going to understand when it's time to engage with content and when are we going to use the opportunities to talk to people to use more traditional push advertising messages? And we have to get better at all of that. Up there. Hi. Uh, my name is Mitch Spolin. I'm the head of sales for Yahoo. I know a lot of you up there. So um, I wanted to ask a question. So I heard a lot of discussion about how, in some situations, it would be irresponsible to recommend branding on the internet. And you know, as I think and I listen to, you know, advertising for me is always simple. It's like how advertising is about influencing people's behavior. 
at, at the root of it. And, and it can be, as I agree, and I agree with a lot of the commentary about how banners are, 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 are it has such a negative connotation, it has such an association with, with what advertising on the web is, to which it really shouldn't. So as we've redesigned the web and changed the creative canvas and it allowed for storytelling on the web, we've seen unbelievable impact. So my, my question is pretty simple. So last week, I'd love your, to hear your feedback, is last week CBS took over Yahoo in many respects. Yahoo TV took over the login page of Yahoo, which is a brand new creative canvas, took over the home page. And they owned the week to drive people, tell their stories, preview their shows, drive them to television to watch that night. And when I checked, not only did, this, did the days that these uh, messages run, that every show spiked in terms of search behavior, not only show, but the network, not only the network, but the actors and actresses, they won every time slot that they, they were advertising in. So that influenced people's behavior to tune in that night. So if we're using online to drive to an offline vehicle, clearly it has to work. So your point is that internet advertising works. I think we would all agree with you. For building brands specifically. Yeah, no, I, I, the, the only comment I made was, it, we, we were talking a lot about the post-advertising world. The only comment I made was, it might be irresponsible to say, in all cases, only do internet advertising. That's I would it. agree with that as well. Yeah. Take one more question, then we're going to wrap up here. Up, up here. Uh, you got a lot of people who want to ask questions. Give somebody the microphone. We'll have one more question. <laughs> All right, there you go. What's that? All right, you want to do a couple more? Fine. What's that? Two minutes. Two? Well, really quick question. No speech. If it's not quick, don't do it. It, it won't. No speech, but the future of media, what's the government's role if there is any role? I didn't hear the question. What is the government's role in the future Ooh. of media if there's any role? Can somebody want to give a... It could a, be a two-hour talk. Uh, right there. Yeah. I, I was going to say, is there a 140-character answer to that? Yeah, that yeah, I'll give you an answer. Yeah. They should simply uh, mandate that uh, no uh, distribution network can control what content the uh, consumer can see and cannot see. Net neutrality. That's all we need. Um, Some anti-farm bill legislation would be good, too. <laughs> Uh, but the, 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 the real answer, it's, it will be uh, a big role, probably uh, ever, ever growing, ever bigger. And around privacy. <clears throat> privacy is the big thing, particularly with this administration. I think they should stay out. Well, as, as, you, can tell, as you can tell from this last exchange, there, there are probably many more issues that we didn't get into than, than we did or were able to, even though we had a lot of time. Uh, and a lot of people. It's an enormously complex issue. It'll be interesting to come back next year and see. Now, notice that we didn't hear any hard and fast predictions, but we did get into some trends. I think there was consensus around the notion of a vastly empowered consumer and how her behavior and, and her desire to connect in her own networks is going to change the business of, of, of everybody here. But how that plays out for companies big and small is still something uh, that's ahead of us. Uh, I want to thank all the panelists for their generosity and their uh, willingness to engage in this dialogue, and thank you. Thank you very much.